This is a time to confess sins. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to speak to your mind. When we commit personal sin, we take our life away out from under the Spirit's control, his, from, out from under His guidance. And we actually, in a sense, tell the Spirit, I got it from here. And we commit sin. And the way that, that the Lord in 1 John 1, 9 explains that we get back into that relationship, into that fellowship with the Spirit is by admitting our sins, just being honest. So you take a minute and you just silently tell the Lord where you are in your life. What's going on? What's happening with you? All right. Well, Father, we are grateful for Jesus Christ. In this time of year, we, we seek to celebrate him and worship him and make, it a time, make this time about him often feels artificial to me. I mean, it's like a lot of effort that, that never actually gets to him. It mostly just is focused on things. So I pray this year that for our experience that we could have a sense of his presence in our life. We would understand what he's trying to teach us and say to us and what he wants for us, not from us. This year at Christmas time, we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Come on in, Ken. There's some sheets right here on the end of the table if you didn't get one. I want to talk... Ron said this had to be about Christmas, so I want to talk about what the theology says is the impeccability of Jesus Christ. That means it's perfection. He was impeccable, meaning not only was he pure, holy, but he was in his divine nature incapable of becoming unholy. But in his human nature, the question is, could he actually sin? And the answer, I believe, is yes. Three decisions frame all of history, angelic and human history. The first is the fall of Satan. In eternity past, when Satan decided that he was so wonderful and great that he began to admire himself... And he began to covet a crowd of other angels to admire him as well. He fell and created the fallen angels. The second decision was with Adam in the garden was the fall of man when they disobeyed God. And the third decision was the obedience of Jesus Christ in the garden of Gethsemane when he agreed finally to go to the cross. When he faced every last temptation and, and said, not my will, but thy will be done. Those three choices and decisions are the framework for what we are in now. So the question for us is, will we follow the pattern of Lucifer who disobeyed God and Adam who disobeyed God? Or will we father, follow the pattern of Jesus Christ who said, not my will, but thy will be done? And that's our choice day to day to learn and understand, to inform ourselves about how that works and what it's about, about the inner workings of our soul so that we can choose and to apply that to our life in a way that leads us more and more toward the Lord. I've said many times that I, I dislike it when preachers tell me what to do, but they don't tell me how to do it. Be like Christ. The goal is to become like Christ. Okay. I'm not anything like Christ, not even close. So help me find the path that takes me there. So two things I want today to share with you. One is the person of Jesus Christ that we might we might celebrate him I don't do that near enough 
My focus is me and my choices and rather than him. I think in actuality that celebrating and worshiping him is a really an advanced place. It's a place of maturity where his perfection is something to marvel at. To marvel at him. As I understand more and more about his perfection, as compared to my imperfection. See, you don't really understand what it means to be virgin born without a sin nature until you consider what it means to be born in Adam with a sin nature. I make that comparison today. So two things, to see his perfection and the other is to compare it with ours and, and, and lay out the path toward him so that we might take one more step today. <clears throat> Listen, you're not going to get there today. Not going to get there in this lifetime. In the next lifetime, God will automatically make that happen. We will be like him in every way. But that will be something God finishes. So the goal, listen, the goal is to be on that journey when you cross over the river to the other side, to be on that journey to becoming conformed to the image of his son. Okay? So, this, the context for the birth and life of Jesus begins with the creation and righteousness of God. He created Adam and Eve righteous, perfect before their fall, both in their standing before God and in their nature as they were created by God. He created them righteous, and when they fell, they became unrighteous. Let's do it like this. God's righteousness... His perfect rightness. Everything about God is right. Whatever God is, is right. Whatever God says is right, is what right is. Okay? He gets to decide what right is. So, righteousness is literally a measuring stick that he uses to determine if a creature is worthy of blessing are worthy of cursing. There's no in-between for him. God is a person of absolutes. Everything God does is 100%. It's not 99.9, it's 100%. So, under the righteousness of God, if creatures, that would be angels and man, are found to be righteous, this is really important. This explains the cross and why there had to be a cross why everybody has to believe in Christ, to be, it explains it. If we're found to be righteous, then God can only bless us. Everyone, everything that, is, that, it, that goes through the, the is measuring stick of God's righteousness and measures up is to be blessed. No exception. But everything unrighteous and that includes everything that's 99.99 percent right the almost okay is unrighteous god cannot accept it if he were to accept anything less than perfect righteousness he would compromise his character and he would cease to be god he not only can't do it, he never would do that. Therefore, when Adam and Eve were created righteous, they lived under the umbrella of God's blessing. Everything in their life was part of that blessing package. When they sinned, same with, look, same with the angels. I believe Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, explains that the angels were created before us. They lived in a state of perfection until Lucifer and one-third of the angels rebelled against God, decided they were going to take the throne. <laughs> the, the, listen, sin 
drives you crazy. It makes you insane. These people having sinned, these angels having sinned and confirmed their sin, we don't know if God offered them salvation, if he did or didn't. I think he did, but I have no proof. They said no. They got locked in. When they got locked in their sin, they began to believe that they could actually win. They could defeat God. Anyway, so they fell and became unrighteous. Then when Adam and Eve, who were created righteous, chose to disobey God, they became unrighteous, and now they're under what? God's cursing. You say, okay. So y'all follow that? You say, okay, what does that have to do with me? I didn't eat any fruit in the Garden of Eden. No. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 explains, actually the whole chapter 5 explains that in Adam, let's do it this way, in Adam, who's now unrighteous, we're born in him, and we inherit his unrighteous standing, his unrighteous status, we inherit it. We're born into it, born into it. Therefore, when we're born, what are we deserving of from God? Not blessing, although his grace covers us. I believe all the way to the age of accountability when you have to choose for yourself. And so what Christ did on the cross, what the cross did was it took all of man's unrighteousness, placed it on Jesus, hello, and he paid for it. Okay? Everything that would cause us to be unrighteous before God, the score for that, the payment for that was made and settled. Boom. In the courtroom of heaven, when you got saved... Just to visualize this, you listen, you Ephesians 1.18, use the eyes of your heart to see this. The moment you believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to be your only way to be saved, to go to heaven, zoop, you're taken to the courtroom of heaven. The judge is up there, the accuser who's the devil's over here, and your defense attorney, Jesus Christ, is there in your center stage. And the file is brought out on your sins, you know, and it's pretty doggone big, you know. So all these sins are read. The accuser says, you know, they're true. The righteous judge, the father says, yes, they're true. Your defense attorney stands up, big drama here, and said, yes, it's all true. But it's all paid for. Already paid for. It's done. When you believe that he, what he did is your ticket, then the credit he earned for you on the cross is credited to your account. It's like your bank account was minus a zillion dollars, and now it's a zillion dollars to the plus side. Boom. He who knew no sin did what? Became sin on our behalf so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Point is, he took our sin, our unrighteousness, and there it is. He took this for us and gave us his own righteousness. All right? Now, I wanted to give that that's the context where we find ourselves. We're created righteous. If you refer to your sheet, in Genesis 1.26, the Lord said, Let us, the Trinity, make man in our image according to our likeness. So he designed us. He designed your inner self. Now, this is not your body. We don't look like God. God doesn't look like us, except Jesus does. But God is a spirit. He used his inner, his inner self, his spiritual self, as the pattern for us. 
And part of that was perfect righteousness, perfect sinlessness. We're, we're in God's image. Boom. Righteous. So, it's how he determines who or what is acceptable. So, we started with a righteous standing, meaning that we created perfect, flawless, sinless. We, it means we were, the, as we stood before God, we were acceptable. We were on this side. Therefore, God could only bless. When they fell, they kept them on that side, and therefore, God can only curse. Two issues. One is your, is your positional status, which has to do with this. Either you're over here or over here. You can't be in between. Out of either of these is connected a nature. We call this the old sin nature. This is the divine nature. And out of this nature plus human experience equals beliefs that we developed, that we do develop beliefs by which we live our life. Simple system. Our righteous standing and our righteous nature. You see, a righteous nature, what's different than us? This is what's important. In a righteous nature, you naturally choose God. Unrighteous nature, you naturally choose self. It's me. It's how does this affect me? With a righteous nature, what did Jesus do? He was willing to give himself up to promote his father. Everything was about God. With the unrighteous nature, the sin nature, everything's about me. See, the sin nature doesn't just make you sin. It's not like uh, we often personify the sin nature as if it's a person inside of us talking to us. It's a, it's a nature. It's what we naturally do. That's what a nature is. It's what is the nature of a, of a dog? You know, uh, uh, dogs, all dogs are the same in some ways. They have a nature. So do cats and People, men and women, have a nature. So, with a divine nature, you naturally put God first. With a human, or see, there's a, there was a human nature before there was a sin nature. Follow that? You got the divine nature. He created them. They've got a, a sinless, righteous human nature. Once they fell, they had a sin nature. Their human nature became corrupted into a sin nature. Their normal human nature naturally looked to God and put God first and obeyed God and loved God and wanted God, hungry for God. Once they fell, sin like a disease infected their hearts, their minds, so they wanted to promote self. What's good for me? The divine nature says, what's good for God, trusting that God will take care of me? It's not wrong to say, what about me? It's normal. You're a, you're a sentient creature. You are going to be aware of what's going on around you in your own experiences for all eternity. You're not going to sleep and never wake up. You're not going to cease to exist you're going to pass into the next life and be aware. That's what I believe. Now, that's pretty important. If that's the case, <laughs> then anything that you and I can do on this side to prepare for that, which is going to last a long, long time, pretty important stuff. So, our nature, which was a normal human nature, was the same nature that Jesus had. Jesus was a perfect human being. Okay? 23 male chromosomes provided by the Holy Spirit joined with the 23 chromosomes of Mary's egg in the womb and formed a perfect human being. 
born perfect like Adam was created perfect. Same nature. Now, what was different about Jesus? Listen, we're born alone. You're born alone in your soul. Jesus had the Holy Spirit and God the Father in his soul, probably even in the womb. Even in the womb, the Holy Spirit was speaking to him. At birth, in his early childhood years, the Holy Spirit was there to protect him. Do you know, can you imagine, just think for a second, from, from the day you're born to you're, maybe you're five or six years old, and perhaps you're not born into the best of circumstances, okay? I mean, I mean with a mother and father that are attentive to you, that have the means to take care of you, that love you, that are available, that, that they're strong, mature people that give and give and give to you to nurture. Maybe you didn't get all that. Can you imagine how much that person would misunderstand about God's plan for eternity during that little period of time? I mean, if all of the human experience is negative, or much of it, then this little person who knows no thing, he has no understanding, no knowledge, nothing to relate to, no frame of reference to draw on, only what he experiences moment by moment by moment. A lot of negativity is going to form. If you, if you teach, if you're a school teacher, you see it all the time. Sally, yeah, you see it all the time. All this negativity that's been put into these children and all the negativity they have chosen for themselves based on their experience. Create, listen, what it does, it creates a lot of misunderstanding about life. They think life is bad. They think life is, is unfair. Much of it's true, but the truth of it, really bottom line, is that what God has planned is incredible. It's perfect. It's wonderful. That's the truth. But Jesus was protected from misunderstanding anything in his life. I'm talking about emotionally. You know, you take a little kid and maybe somebody dies. Maybe m mother dies. That's like, that's like lightning striking a tree. You understand? The tree's going to grow sideways now. It's a terrible blow. We all get these blows in life, some of them early, some of them late. God allows all these things for a purpose to make us who we are. We use those experiences with our sin nature, which puts, I put me first, these, these difficult, hard experiences I use to feel sorry for myself, to build defenses so that I don't feel the pain, uh, to blame others, perhaps even God, to come up with a strategy of trying to make it through here without being hurt again, all kinds of crazy human defenses and systems that we develop. Jesus, and listen, this is the stuff we have to overcome when we get saved. This is what we have to overcome to be able to fully give ourselves to the Lord. Jesus didn't have any of it. Now, did Jesus have difficult experiences? We know Joseph died somewhere. I mean, he wasn't around when we... He's there at 12 years old. But at 30 years old, when we resume his life, when the, when the story picks back up, he's not there. So apparently he's gone. He's died. <laughs> they ran him off or something. I don't know, but... Hard to believe that they ran him off, but uh, so Jesus has dealt with that. He has dealt with being the man of the house. He has dealt with growing up with all the other kids, 
You know, he's dealt with growing up with brothers and sisters. You know, you think you're perfect, you know, uh, and, you know, never getting in trouble. Here's the kid that never gets in trouble. <laughs> you know, hey, we're going to sneak out and smoke some cigarettes. You know, Jesus is like, I'm going to have to tell mom. You know, I would, dang. They go to school the next day and say, you think you got it bad. What if you had Jesus as your brother? You know, I mean, all of the injustice that life brings to bear on a human soul from the devil's corruption in this world was brought to bear on him. And he never reacted inappropriately to it. He never got the wrong idea. He was tempted to misunderstand and think, life is so unfair. Father, how could you do that? He was tempted to feel that way, to think that way. Never did. Never did. Every single step of the way, listen, let me try to make this a little bit clearer. This is really important to understand, to try to get an understanding of him. It took me a lot of years to get this. If this is your heart, you start off your life building basic beliefs, basic ideas about how life works. Like I said, if you were nurtured and loved and encouraged and all that as a little kid, then you have some very positive ideas. If not, you probably have some very negative ideas about the world. And as time goes on, you build, you build on what you've already believed. Whatever you believe today becomes the basis of what you believe tomorrow. You believe something today, you use what you believe today to evaluate what happens tomorrow. Okay, you follow? So whatever you end up believing way down here, ultimately, they used to call it the self-fulfilling prophecy where you thought something was true and so your beliefs would follow that train of thought. If you thought life is negative and unfair, then everything, maybe way down here, everything's still unfair. You follow that line. So when we get into this thing, I mean, we have a nature. Let's do it. Let's do this. We have a nature, an old sin nature. Here's the divine nature. Our nature corrupts our mind into thinking that we are the most important person in the world. Who's more important than you? To you. I mean, at a certain point of maturity, I mean, if you have kids, you, get, you lay some of that aside. You'll sacrifice yourself for your loved ones and all that. But basically, it's all about me. I mean, I've got four kids, the youngest at 19, and it's still me, 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 me. You understand? So, because it's all about me, if I get what I want, life is good. If I don't get what I want, life is what? Not good. If I get what I want, God is so wonderful. If I go through deprivation, then God is tough. He's a hard man, right? All from the perspective of me. We look at everything in our life from the me. Jesus, and listen, not only do we look at it from the me, but we twist it and we corrupt it and we misunderstand it and we use everything that we get to try to make things better for me. It's all about building me or protecting me. If you grew up in a very difficult situation, you've probably been very careful in your life to protect yourself so that you don't get criticized, so that you don't get disciplined, or, you know, you're very careful you get quiet, all that kind of stuff. But Jesus, on the other hand, watch, this is, you can't, just about can't visualize it. 
in his mind, because he had the Holy Spirit from birth, maybe even before, because he had the Father from birth, everything that happened in his life, he was able to keep God the Father and his interest, his agenda, his plan, primary over, over himself. Plus, he never misunderstood what was going on. He never thought, well, God, my father's so unfair. He never did that. Every one of these building blocks that he put into his soul by faith. See, those are, you, you go through an experience, you, you try to figure out what it was and why it happened and what it means. Whatever conclusions that you reach, based on whatever that you believe, so if you learn something, if you see something or hear something and you go, I don't think I'm going to believe that. It remains like a theory. I heard lots of those in college. But whatever you believe becomes one of your beliefs. It becomes part of you. With the sin nature, all of these beliefs will be skewed toward you being the center of all things the important person in all things. With Jesus, everything was skewed with the Father being the most important person and, and Him playing a role in it. He was able to give Himself to it all along the way. Is that, does that blow your mind? It does me. I mean, He's not like us. He never was. We're born into this. We're born into this selfishness. It's really simply what it is. Just, and we can't help it. It's not like, we can't, it's not a finger wagging thing. It's just a fact. We can't help but be selfish. And our little kids, we think, oh, that's so cute. I mean, I thought it was cute until they got about 16 years old. It wasn't so cute anymore, but started wrecking cars and costing money, uh, but anyway, Jesus, his whole belief system, everything that he entertained in his mind and thought and believed was right, and it served the plan of God. That's what it means to have a nature to serve and love God. He was able to, listen, he was able to step back with, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word. Listen, he was a master at age 12. He had a doctorate in theology. He went to the temple and astounded the teachers there. All these PhD guys sitting around thinking they were something special. He comes in and shows them up. They're like, who is this kid? So he's able to step back and see the whole big picture all along the way and keep it all in perspective. We were swallowed up by the world, by our needs, by our selfishness from day one. Swallowed up. Now, all along the way of your life, I mean, I, I, I just remember going to elementary school and being this quiet kid, protecting myself from criticism. Didn't say much because, you know, you can't be criticized if you don't say much, etc. Going into high school and becoming an athlete, and all of a sudden people liked me and knew my name, and I thought, well, I must be pretty cool. Going off to college, and everybody was cool in college, you know. So I became a, a dummy again. And here I am, you know, the recovering dummy. But our nature and our beliefs and our ideas are very different than his. So the journey of the Christian life is to stop. See, you got your Bibles, Romans 12 too. Go there and you can read all this stuff.
Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says in verse 1, 12, 1, to give your body as a sacrifice. And in verse 2, to give your mind. And he says, and literally stop being conformed to the pattern of the world. When you have the present imperative with the negative may, it means to stop something already in progress. You're already being conformed to the world. You have been since the day you were born. Being sucked up into the world and molded into the world's image. Paul says you got to stop that. When you stop that, that's the day that you stop having opinions unless they come from the Word of God. People say, well, what do you think about so-and-so? And you go, I don't know what I think because I don't know what the Bible says about it. Let me find out what the Bible says about it, and then I'll know what to think. That's when you stop being conformed and start being renewed, which is the goal, is to be renewed to become more like him. So we start off being conformed because of Adam's sin. We're born into it. All of, ex all of human experience lends, leads us to believe that life's a pretty tough place. And I have found it to be tough. Have, have you found it to be pretty tough? I mean, I know Kneep over there, he's just sailing through it. I mean, it's like, you got it made, don't you, Kurt? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I know. Uh, I spent uh, quite a few days with Chafin here recently, and uh, he's pretty much on the end of the journey. And I uh, would just pray, ask you to pray that he would, that the Lord would just ease him, take him out easy. I mean, he's been through enough suffering, well, a lot of suffering. But uh, so the goal is to be renewed. And uh, Genesis 3 put us into the sinful nature. They lost their righteous status. We inherited their loss of righteous status. You see them immediately demonstrate this new nature instead of going to God. Look, you would think that, that they've spent all this time with God. They just made the worst mistake of their life. And you would think that they would turn to him and go, help. I mean, first of all, when Eve ate the fruit and Adam hadn't eaten it yet, seems to me, of course, I know it's not true. It seems to me that he should have gone, hello, hello, we need some help over here. You know, clean up on aisle four. Need some help. What did he do? Who did he choose? He chose his wife. He chose his human companion. Look, who's he putting first? Is he putting her first? No, he's putting himself first. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So he says, hmm, I sure do like those snuggling up on those cold nights. And God don't snuggle too good. So he chose her instead of God. And when they're discovered, instead of going to him and going, all right, what now? They try to cover it up. To cover up their sin. And is that what isn't that what we do? We hide it, we disguise it, we turn it into something righteous. As I was leaving the house, I saw that once again the the, the Marxist socialist folks in America are doing their best to uh, take over our country. And Anyway, so Adam's sin was imputed to us, and we have lived out the story. Jesus, by contrast, had no sin nature. He naturally hungered for the word, discerned the truth from the lie, believed God, and submitted to the will of God. Life events that commonly evoked old man strategies in a sinful person were interpreted and handled within his mind 
according to the will of God. He never believed anything false. He only believed truth, and every life choice was based on the truth of God's word. So, impeccability. That means the purity, the perfection of Christ without flaw or sin. He's a lamb without blemish, means no sin nature, and without spot. No, Ron always says, no birth defects and no growth defects. And what that means, he had no sin nature at birth, and he never grew in a wrong way. He never believed wrong things. No false beliefs or personal sin. I mean, imagine, you know, the guy's a carpenter, so he hits his thumb with a hammer. I mean, maybe even if he hit his thumb with a hammer, he's, maybe he was that perfect. But he don't, he don't get mad and start flinging golf words. You know the golf words? Anyway. His divine nature, he was unable to sin. In the human nature, he was able to sin, but did not. He was tempted in the way that we are, Matthew 4, 1 through 11, yet Hebrews 2, 13, without sin. He was born with a perfect human nature into a perfect relationship with the Father and the Spirit. It's hard for me to imagine he was filled with the Spirit at birth. I mean, he was... The Spirit was indwelling him and filling his mind, influencing his thinking, even as a baby. It's just hard to fathom that. He had a relationship. He had spiritual eyes from birth. And his relationship with the Father was, he was aware of it. He was open to it. He could see it. He experienced a natural hunger for truth pursuing the Lagos and built all of his beliefs, viewpoints, and relationships, actions on the truth of the Old Testament scriptures. You see, the Old Testament scriptures, the scriptures themselves are like a puzzle. Difficult to, you know, there's like the surface reading of it, and the more you put it together, you see that, okay, there's a whole other level of understanding there. And then there's a whole other level of understanding. On the surface, it appears that the Old Testament was telling them, if you obey all of these rituals and laws, then, then God will bless you. And that's what they turned it into, a work system. In reality, the Mosaic law was uh, meant to reveal to them that they had a sin nature and they were incapable of keeping it. She had a deeper meaning. And only those who are trying to see with spiritual eyes could see that. We know there were the, some that could see it. Uh, Anna at the temple. What was the other guy's name? Simeon. Simeon, who's just a regular Old Testament believer, had seen through the whole Old Testament facade of the surface seen down into the guts and heart of the message and he understood it fully explained it to Eve I mean explained it to Mary on the steps she, he said this guy's is going to be a light to the Gentiles and he's going to he's going to carry a sword that's going to be put in your heart he explained the whole program he understood it so Jesus was able to do that he he looked for the truth beneath the surface. By contrast, the rest of mankind is born with a selfish nature, separated from God. We put ourselves first. We want everything to work out our way. Don't we? Now, I'm not going to last for a show of hands of who was happy and who was sad last weekend. Football game, you know. Uh, be honest with you. I mean, now my wife's not here, so I can speak freely. Uh, <laughs> I was not at home. 
I, in fact, I was visiting Chafin when that game ended. So I waited a little bit longer. <laughs> I was planning on leaving, so I waited over there a little bit longer, let things cool off before I made it back to the house. But point being, we learn more from our adversities than we ever do from our successes. The temptations of Jesus came from the outside, from the devil, the evil forces, and even his own family and disciples. The devil tempted him in the desert to act independently of God's plan and will. You know, John was asking me, do we have a plan for what's going to happen next for our church? And I said, you know, it would be nice if we did, but you know, God doesn't reveal himself to us like that. He doesn't lay out the whole plan ahead of time. He shows you one piece at a time. And the issue is really to trust and obey him way more than what he's actually trying to show and give you. But I know many of us feel much more comfortable with something concrete to hang on to that we can see and touch and feel and manipulate and try to make into our own. It's really not how God works, though. So. You know, his provision comes how often? One day at a time. His provision for you comes one day. You say, well, I've got a whole lot more than just I need for one day. Well, That's a whole other discussion. In Matthew 16, we understand that Peter and the disciples never understood his mission. Can you imagine he walked through this whole thing, all this pressure from the devil, from the forces of religion, the leaders of his own nation that he loved, and the people closest to him, his own family, none of them believed in him. None of his brothers believed in him. The disciples who were supposed to be his confidants did not understand what he was doing. When Jesus began to explain that he had to go to Jerusalem and be killed and all that, Peter stood up and said, stop <coughs> talking that way. Why are you so negative about everything? Matthew 26 in Gethsemane. He said, let this cup pass, but, but not my will, but yours. Matthew 26 and 27, he was betrayed. Peter denied him. The rest, of, hey, it was so funny. Everybody said, we'll never, he, Jesus said, you're all going to leave me tonight. And every one of them said, not me. I will never abandon you. And every one of them did. The mockings, the beating, the scourging, and the crucifixion itself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All the forces of evil and hardships of life required him to choose his father's will so he could ma maintain his impeccability and qualify to be the sacrifice for sins. So had he chosen to sin even one time, he would not have qualified to be the sacrifice and we would still be in our sins. Even as the perfect son of God, he learned obedience through suffering. Now, again, it took me a long time to understand this. Let me see if I can help you with it. I'll just share with, would y'all turn into your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18? I want to show you something real quick. Can y'all see that? Eyes of your heart. In Ephesians 1.18, Paul's prayer is that I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened or given light so that you may know, or the word Ido means to see, what is the hope of his calling Let me see if I can find it again. I'll always, what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory and inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power? Point being, 
with the eyes of your heart, which is your ability to see with your mind, you're able to visualize spiritual phenomena. The hope of his call. What is the hope of his calling? I mean, the confidence of being of who we are in Christ. He wants you to see that with your mind. The riches of his glorious inheritance for all of the believers. How do you see? What do you see as riches in Christ? How do you see that? You can though, right? Can you see that in your mind? I don't know what it looks like. I mean, I see streets of gold and I don't know what I see. Better not tell you what I see. Eyes of your heart. So I want to give your eyes of your the eyes of your heart a little diagram that maybe you can relate to. If this is your heart, Psalm 23 calls you your soul a cup. My cup runneth over. And on this side, as a believer, is the old sin nature and the old man beliefs. And on this side is the divine nature and the new man beliefs. The visual is we start salvation pretty much with this full of ideas and beliefs from the world. But our new man believes empty. The only thing you got here is the gospel, the foundation for everything. So you're a faithful believer and you're hungry, by the way, which is being hungry for the word is not something that happens automatically. It's something you have to choose. If you're struggling with your hunger, you have to choose it. It doesn't just happen. So, you start to learn, you go to Bible class, you find somebody that, that teaches, you start to learn, and it begins to build, you, you believe with, you use faith to believe what you're learning, and it begins to build up this new man over here. Knowledge, understanding. Hopefully at the same time, at some point, you begin to unload this side. Paul says to lay this aside and put this on. And so he says, be renewed and then put it on. So there's a learning phase and an implementation phase. The whole Christian life, this journey towards coming, becoming like Jesus, is about freeing ourselves from the lies of the world to which we have enslaved ourselves. Enslave, look, you're always a slave. You don't get to be a free agent. You're now, when you're, when you're born again, you're enslaved to the things of the world. God enables us through, the God, through God the Holy Spirit to be free from that, to build this new man system, and to enslave yourself to this new system, enslave yourself to the Lord. That's the journey. Right? We can see that, right? So, look, we keep on. I encourage you during this time of uncertainty in our church, in our group. Listen, the church is not a building. You understand that? Listen, it's us. It's us. We are the church. And wherever we go and wherever we meet is the church. So we have to stop thinking in terms, I know we have to have a building. I'm not stupid. We're not going to meet out in my backyard. But we have to have a place to meet, and God will provide a place to meet. He will do that. He will do that when it's time. He will do that when it's ready. He will do that when we're ready. Until then, stick together. Take care of each other. Listen, I need you to pray for me. I'm a little bit tired right now. I've been burning the candle. I've been up at the hospital just about every day. Now, I don't really know how I ended up with Steve as that ministry, that ministry with Steve, but I did. And apparently I'm supposed to do that for us. Because he's not the only one I'm helping. There's others that I'm helping. 
that's part of my job here is as one of the leaders and pastors and 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 the see as a leader you're not a, you don't lead anything you know how you lead you go first the leader is the one that goes first so the people that are in need that the lord makes me aware of i just try to help however i can and uh i, I do that to help them to encourage you and if you need me for counsel for anything but money you know that that part, the lord hadn't just uh, chosen to bless us but anyway let's go to him and uh let's close i hope this has been helpful to you to see the difference between us and jesus how incredibly pure and righteous and holy and right and right and good he is father we are so grateful that your righteous, perfect son, who had every right to say no, said yes, to pay our way, to intervene on our behalf in this downhill spiral that we've been snatched out of the jaws of destruction and placed on a hill of great beauty and wonder forever and he is this beacon we don't need lights father he's the light the light comes from within his soul and shines abroad gives us light to see everything the true light is in our heart within we see it with the eyes of our heart so make these things sensible to us some of us father are so naturally concrete in the way we relate to our life we need something to be able to hang our hat on, to see, to have some kind of form that we can grasp. So I pray that you shine light so the eyes of our hearts might see clearly the perfection of Jesus so that we are inspired to be full of awe and wonder and love, appreciation. Pray for my mother-in-law, Jane that you will strengthen her body for those that are trying to care for her. Pray for my friend Steve, your son, your child. Is he's passing through here, Father, and he's transitioning to the other side. I pray that you comfort his heart, that you give him moments of clarity where he can speak and hear and celebrate what's happening. Uh, I pray for our church, Father. I pray for I pray for each of us that we would stick together, we would love one another, that we would think of each other as family and not just some people we used to go to church with. We're in a difficult time in our country, Father, and I I pray that you would protect us from evil, those who want to destroy and take away our freedoms and to enslave us in the cause of equal outcomes and what they say is fairness when it's re reality, it's control. Protect us, Father. Although the world has gone this way, and I know that we eventually will, I just pray, Father, that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear. We love you. We praise you now in Christ's name. Amen.